Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, today's lecture on refining American values in the world spotlight, the intersection between Cold War U.S. foreign policy and U.S. domestic policy. And I'm here to introduce Dr. Amy Sayward, who is a professor of history right here at our own MTSU. She graduated summa cum laude from her undergraduate university, St. Bonaventure University, which is in western New York State near Lake Erie. And both her master's degree and her PhD are from Ohio State University in Columbus, um, where, frankly, quite a number of our MTSU History Department faculty did their doctoral research. Dr. Sayward has held many positions um, here at, in administration at MTSU. She was chair of the history department for a number of years. She became associate dean of the College of Graduate Studies, Studies for a number of years. She's currently chair of the university's general education committee. Um, she was the co-organizer of a statewide bridging cultures um, program for about a year and a half through the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Tennessee Board of Regents for a period of time. And um, she teaches history here at, at our university. She directs also in all of her spare time um, all sorts of civic or organizations in which she is fiercely involved. She works to abolish the death penalty and to help women right here locally in Rutherford County who are transitioning from incarceration. Um, Professor Sayward is the author of two edited books on Tennessee's history, including Tennessee's New Abolitionists, uh, in which she collaborated with other activists about anti-death penalty matters. And I expect the Trumpian proposal to execute drug providers, perhaps uh, drug company executives, uh, is perhaps a concept uh, she could spend some time discussing if that's what we were talking about during this hour. She is executive director of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer, which is headquartered uh, here at MTSU because she is the executive director of that academic organization. She's also written two books on the United Nations, and she is basing her lecture here today in part on her most recent book, The United Nations in International History, which came out just about a year ago. And again, she's speaking on refining American values in the world spotlight. I present to you Dr. Amy Sayward. Thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction and for the opportunity to speak with you here today. Um, I have always been particularly interested in foreign policy and how it intersects with domestic policy. Um, one of the things that historians are always asking and telling students they should do is figure out who's the author, what's the source, what perspective do they bring. So this is me. I'm a Cold War kid. I was born in 1969. Um, at that point, Ronald Reagan became president of the United States, and he remained president of the United States until I was a junior in college. So I grew up with Ronald Reagan as my president, and therefore tended to believe that because the Cold War, the U.S. was facing off with uh, the Soviet Union. The maps in my classroom look kind of like this. In blue, so the old blue states, blue states and red states didn't always refer to Democrats and Republicans. They used to refer to the free world. See the dark blue, the United States were uh, strong, true blue. Lighter blue are folks who are generally allied with us. And dark red, the Soviet Union, the evil empire, according to Ronald Reagan and other shades of red and blue. And the world was divided into these sort of easy binaries. On the one side, the forces of truth, goodness, light, freedom. The other side, um, totalitarianism and such. And then I went off to college. And much like you, I was an honor student at St. Bonaventure University. And suddenly, history became a little more messy. Uh, those easy sort of one side versus the other when I was looking at things like the Cuban Revolution and the Vietnam War suddenly became a little more complex. So um, I want us to look at today some of that complexity. Um, one of the things I want you, you know, to think about is those values don't go away. Don't go away. I'm still a very idealistic person. I fight for policies that I think are important and right on the domestic scene and in terms of foreign policy. But I want us today to look back in history a little bit 
and to understand the ways in which American values are always being defined, redefined, clarified as we move back and forth between domestic policy and foreign policy. And I want us today to look at that oscillation back and forth between the two. Um, in particular, we're going to look at the ways in which the early Cold War American values, particularly the idea of human rights that the U.S. saw itself as something of a champion of, how that position gets challenged by the Soviet Union, by the Third World, and ultimately how some of the international criticism coming back at the United States will influence U.S. presidents' views towards the emerging civil rights movement in the United States. So that's what we're going to look at a little bit today. So, the United States had some really good reasons to think that they should be seen as the champion of human rights in the world. After all, the Declaration of Independence established that idea of fundamental rights. We followed it up with the Bill of Rights. And by the time we hit World War II, we've got about 170 years of functioning democratic Republican government. No other country in the world could say that, right? So that's all to the good. World War II, Franklin Roosevelt builds that out into the Atlantic Charter, which were the war goals of the Allies. Norman Rockwell makes the Atlantic Charter famous by drawing pictures of freedom of speech, freedom of religion. These were the things that the Allies were fighting for in World War II. And these are exactly the types of things that get written into the UN Charter um, that the United States helps to lead the charge on the creation of the United Nations and signing its charter. So this all looks good, right? But the US State Department, um, in looking at human rights uh, in the early Cold War, says, well, there's a really big problem with this um, effort to pose ourselves as a champion of human rights and, human va and values, those American values. Um, and that is racial segregation and the violence that underlay that system in the United States. So racial segregation, drinking separate schools, drinking fountains, uh, the process of redlining or identifying which areas could receive um, funding for mortgages, which couldn't. In some ways, those were the more benign aspects of the racial uh, segregation in the United States. But it was clear to African Americans in particular that violence and the threat of violence underlay that social hierarchy, which included lynching, which included, for example, this is um, Emmett Till,'s death, violent death, becomes very much a rallying point for African Americans. These images would be very damaging to any sense of the United States promoting itself as a champion of human rights. And ultimately, it's not until African Americans gain full legal civil rights that the United States has any real ability to put itself forward effectively as a leader in human rights. So right off the bat, after the United Nations is established, a group called the National Negro Congress decides that since the UN Charter calls for human rights for all people regardless of race or religion, that it was going to bring a um, petition before the United Nations. Um, they enlisted a historian um, who pulled together um, their petition to the United Nations on behalf of 13 million oppressed Negro citizens of the United States of America on the 6th of June, 1946. Among the other statistics listed, it pointed out that more than 40% of black children finished no more than four years of formal education in the United States because of the economic and educational discrimination they posed. Well, the first Director General of uh, the United Nations, uh, Turgiv Lai, didn't really know what to do with this petition. Right? So the United Nations is supposed to stand for human rights, but they didn't really have much of a mechanism set up yet for what to do with this. So he receives this petition, um, doesn't really know what to do with it. Soviet Union, they know exactly what to do with this. They begin, you know, putting out propaganda, uh, news around the world. You know, they particularly pull incidents of lynching and violence towards black American veterans of World War II. 
and says, is this the country that's supposed to be promoting human rights? Um, this doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, the State Department simply said, well, the National Negro Congress is a communist front organization. And that charge had some validity. They were allied with the Communist Party. Um, they were organizing African Americans as one part of a strategy um, to help change the United States, bring it closer to the Soviet Union. But there was also some truth in what was presented. And therefore, groups like the NAACP, interestingly, the government of um, Bolivia, and several groups from the West Indies and other civil rights organizations also backed this petition to the United Nations. What's the response of the United States? Well, in addition to trying to uh, marginalize the National Negro Congress, um, they work to make sure that the new UN Commission on Human Rights will have almost no power. Um, in fact, they maneuver it into such a position that the head of that organization in February of 1947 said it had, quote, no power to take any action in regard to any complaints regarding human rights. That's the head of the UN Commission on Human Rights saying they have no power to take any action in regard to any complaints about human rights. Not a very strong and vital organization uh, right off the bat. But what's quickly emerging is the United States has a problem. They at least have a PR problem. They may have a deeper problem in terms of the way the country is working. And in fact, they do, because the NAACP then picks up the National Negro Congress's eight-page petition, adds statistical indices, points out the uh, pervasiveness of both violence and discrimination, and they bring it back to the UN Commission on Human Rights. Um, they also make sure the Human Rights Commission does that this is a confidential report, that no more than 10 people can be in the room, and they're hoping that this doesn't get out, this appeal to the world. However, W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the founders of the NAACP, made sure it was leaked to the press and the United States, ultimately is going to have to respond when they head off to Geneva um, in 1947 to the UN Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. Wouldn't you like to have that job, be the person in the State Department, Jonathan Daniels? Your job is to head off to Geneva and to defend the United States before the Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities after an appeal to the world has come out. Not the best job in the world to have. Um, the Russian had an easier job. Um, Alexander Borisov um, pointed out not only the widespread violence that was documented in an appeal to the world, but he also pointed out that the Liberian, Ethiopian, and Haitian delegates to the United Nations couldn't find a place, a hotel that would let them stay um, in New York City um, based on their color, regardless of what station they held in the United Nations. Um, but if it's your job to defend the United States, that's what you're going to do. So Jonathan Daniels said, look, President Truman has created a commission on civil rights. Here's the official press photograph, and they have written a report. And this shows how seriously the President of the United States is taking this issue. Does it convince you? Um, well, the United States and the Truman administration are going to go on the offensive, right? So after Geneva, after the appeal to the world, they are the moving force behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is approved by the General Assembly um, in 1948. I have tried to summarize the 28 general rights um, that are listed in the UN General uh, Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there are a lot of them. Um, anyone notice any that the United States currently does not recognize as a right? Rest and leisure. Rest and leisure. Especially as students, you might notice, gee, I'd really like to have that. Um, so there are a lot of different rights that were here. How is it that this passes unanimously before the UN General Assembly? Now, first, there are only 51 countries as opposed to the 190 plus we have today. But how does 
why does everyone not vote against it? Because it's not legally binding. Everyone said, yep, we think those are great things. Um, but no one is legally bound to follow them <laughs> or to have them. It is a general declaration of principles. So from the United States perspective, they're like, it's like the Declaration of Independence, right? We say that everyone has right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that takes us a while to figure out how to actually make that work in terms of the government. So the idea was the same here. We're going to issue the Declaration of Human Rights, and then we'll figure out how to make it legally binding through um, covenants regarding uh, human rights. Anyone want to guess how long it takes the covenants to make it to the United Nations? Well, they're finally proved in 1976. I was alive then. I wasn't alive in 1948. It takes a long, long, long time. Um, and some countries approve some of them and not approve others of them. So again, the United States appears like it is on top, right? It's the moving force. Indeed, anyone recognize this lady here who chaired the UN Human Rights Commission? And is there in the press photograph? Eleanor Roosevelt, right? So former first lady, advocate of civil rights um, to various degrees, one of the founding, one of the early members of the NAACP. So this all is looking good, right? The United States is looking good. Now, I said no one voted against the Universal Declaration, but some folks chose not to vote for it. A number of countries abstained. Anyone want to guess who? Uh, the US did not abstain. But the entire Soviet bloc did. So the Soviet Union, um, also Saudi Arabia. Uh, they didn't necessarily buy into um, all of these ideas. And South Africa, which has even more of a race problem than the United States has um, at this point. So those countries um, abstained. But it's going to be really hard to figure out who gets what rights and what is the connection between the rights of the individual, the community, and the nation state. And that's something we're still trying to figure out to this day. Um, so the Truman administration you know, felt like they were doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, here's the Eleanor Roosevelt. Her hat is taller than most of the other delegates. Um, but there she is, um, heading up the uh, UN Commission on Human Rights. She's not going to survive the change in administrations, however. So Dwight D. Eisenhower is going to become president of the United States. He, of course, had helped lead Allied troops uh, during World War II. He felt pretty confident about his ability to lead the United States in the Cold War. But the Cold War is really changing um, as he's moving along. Um, first of all, he's really unhappy with the UN uh, Commission on Human Rights because Eleanor Roosevelt had proposed an amendment. You know, as they were debating the covenants, uh, she said, you know, what we really need is a federal clause. Um, countries like the United States that are a federal government made up of a variety of states, you know, we really can't, under our Constitution, control what every state does. And so she proposes that a country like the United States should get a bit of an exemption. So in other words, um, the United States could say, yep, what, we agree with the, this rights covenant. Now, the state of Mississippi, they might not be doing everything, but we don't have any control over that. That's OK. So the US government could say, we abide by um, the covenant, uh, international uh, covenant. Just Mississippi's a little behind. What do you think the rest of the world thought of that? Yeah, it went down pretty much in flames. Um, it was as well received as Britain and France's suggestion that they should not be held responsible for ensuring rights in their colonial territories. The discourse on human rights is moving forward faster than the United States, Britain, and France are adapting um, at this point, and it's only going to accelerate. But Eisenhower wants to slow things down on the US Commission, uh, UN Commission on Human Rights. He appoints Mary Lord Pillsbury. Um, anyone want to guess what her primary uh, reason for being appointed was? So Eleanor Roosevelt had, you know, obviously a very public life, involved in international work. Mary Lord Pillsbury had worked very hard to make sure that Eisenhower got elected. Um, she had a fair bit of money from the Pillsbury Company and used that to um, help ensure that Eisenhower got elected. The poor lady, first day on the job, 
Her first job was to say, by the way, the United States does not support either of the human rights covenants that are currently being negotiated in the UN Human Rights Commission. But she's got perseverance. She stays there for the whole eight years, um, and the Eisenhower administration doesn't um, care to move forward in terms of human rights there, but the world's changing. The Cold War that Eisenhower expected to fight, first of all, Stalin dies uh, pretty quickly after he becomes president. The Korean War winds down. Who replaces Stalin? Anyone know who this jovial guy is? Nikita Khrushchev. And I chose this photograph. Anyone know who the gentleman he's holding sand up is? Yeah, so that's Fidel Castro of Cuba. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev is much more interested in soliciting third world countries to join the Soviet bloc and become communist states than he is as much interested in direct confrontation with the United States. So the Cold War begins shifting to the third world in a much more significant way. Um, also, 1954, uh, Dien Bien Phu falls. Um, so Vietnamese forces there overthrow the French. French are on their way out of Vietnam. And then in 1955, um, leaders at the Bandung Conference um, come together, um, including um, Nehru uh, from India, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser um, from Egypt, and they begin to argue, we don't have to choose one side or the other in the Cold War. We want our own side. Uh, we want to be non-aligned. So again, the third world, as more and more countries are becoming independent, um, by the time we hit 1960, we have 100 members of the United Nations as opposed to the 51 who originally ratified the charter. So these newly independent countries are changing international relations. Eisenhower is a little slow to um, pick up on this. And then in the uh, school year, 57 to 58 in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, pictures that showed um, whites in Arkansas taunting um, blacks who wanted simply an education that the US Supreme Court had said they were entitled to, again, pulled the United States and its issues of racial segregation into the international spotlight. Uh, what does Soviet propaganda have to say about all of this? Well, they characterize the United States as white-faced but black-souled gentlemen who commit their dark deeds in Arkansas, Alabama, and other southern states, and then put on white gloves and mount the rostrum in the UN General Assembly and hold forth about democracy and freedom. It's a pretty biting characterization. Also, the Soviet Union very interested in distracting the UN from their invasion of Hungary that had just happened. Um, so again, this becomes the football in terms of international diplomacy. But it's not just the Soviet Union. Increasingly, other countries are picking up on and distressed by what's happening in the United States, and increasingly they're seeing it. They're seeing the photographs, they're seeing the newsreels through modern media. Um, the US Foreign Service, concerned about the uh, damage that this is doing, decided to run public opinion surveys in 10 European cities, New Delhi, the capital of India, Mexico City, um, and one other, let me find the other city. Ah, Tokyo. Tokyo. Uh, what they found was public opinion in all of those cities was overwhelmingly unfavorable toward U.S. race relations. They felt that um, African Americans were badly treated and their treatment was simply getting worse. Um, pictures like this that show uh, members of the 101st Airborne required to escort kids to school did nothing to help. And ultimately, the Foreign Service argued that images such as this were weakening our moral position as a champion of freedom and democracy, as well as raising or reinforcing doubts as to the sincerity and strength of our professions of concern for the welfare of others, particularly in the non-white world. The argument is if African Americans are not treated equally in the United States, how will newly independent countries in the Middle East, in Africa, gauge our sincerity.
So the State Department comes up with a great idea. It's symbolic, but maybe significant. 1958 is going to be the world's first World's Fair since World War II, and they want to make a big splash. Here's a photograph of the American Pavilion, and then on the postage stamp, you see it's a great big exhibit, right? We're the leader of the free world, uh, leader in technology. We wanted to present that. But the State Department said we also need to not just focus on the positives, we also need to recognize that we have um, some problems. In fact, they are going to put together an additional um, ex exhibit that's out back um, behind called Unfinished Business. And in that, they are going to deal with the question of racial segregation. So they had tour guides and they had photographs and the very first stop informed you that 17 million Negroes have yet to win all of the human rights promised them by American democracy. But it said, look beyond the headlines. They had lots of headlines about Arkansas and other things. They said, look behind the headlines and look at the ways in which African Americans are making real strides towards equality. So the next stop on the tour invited you to look at increases in voting numbers, um, increasing enrollment in college, increasing wages, and the fact that Southern schools were integrating. So these were all positive things. And then you would go to the last room that featured this photograph that showed black and white children playing together with this idea at the end. American communities, like American individuals, like to emulate and surpass one another. By this process, democracy's unfinished business, already partially mastered, will get done on a national scale. The goal that draws us is not utopia, but larger freedom with more justice. So you see all these American values in here? Democracy is our method. Slowly but surely, it works. So what do you think people thought of this exhibit? 1958, you're not buying it? Well, foreign visitors thought it was disarmingly honest. Said, yep, they're facing up to the fact that they have a problem, that democracy can be messy, and that it may take time to achieve you know, the full vision of American democracy but it received pretty positive views from European visitors. However, some other folks had different ideas about it. Elected officials from the American South um, were pretty negative about it. Uh, so Senator Herman Talmadge, uh, who is a Democrat from South Carolina, before the exhibit even went up, as soon as he heard about it, he wrote to Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, and he couldn't even figure out why this was part of it. He said he couldn't imagine by any stretch of the imagination, how this could be said to be one of a legitimate concern to citizens of other countries. Why are you putting your, our dirty laundry in front of other people? This seemed to him to be completely out of bounds. Um, two representatives, um, Mendel Rivers from South Carolina and Prince Preston from Georgia, went all the way to Brussels, Belgium to look at the exhibit in person and see what the hubbub was about. Uh, so there they are. Um, they objected to the fundamental idea of the whole thing. The idea that segregation was a problem that the United States must solve. They disagreed. <laughs> this is not a problem. This isn't something the United States would solve. This is a state's rights issue. Their states would deal with things. Um, they suggested that if the U.S. wanted to have an exhibit about problems, they had some suggestions for problems that they told the New York Times that could be um, usefully explored. They thought they should look at crime and the influx of Puerto Ricans into the United States, which is kind of a really odd <laughs> set of things, but there they were quoted in the New York Times. So, Eisenhower, what do you think he's going to do in face of Southern criticism of this World's Fair exhibit? Is he a strong advocate for civil rights? It's a little wishy-washy. So ultimately, he's not real happy with this. They close the exhibit, and they put up a public health exhibit, and they move on. Well, we're going to get a new president, elected in 1960, youngest president up until that point. 
who in his inaugural address said that he really had a new vision for America and promoting American values through things like the Peace Corps. Um, he appoints as the Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Um, and Dean, Dean Rusk really wanted to put into place a foreign policy that reflected some of the initiatives that Kennedy had pursued. As a senator, he had particularly focused on uh, diplomacy toward the new African countries. He writes as president to world leaders like Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. He seems much more inclined to bring uh, the third world into American foreign policy as an integral part of American foreign policy. But poor Dean Rusk has got some problems. Primarily, one of the problems that he's having to deal with is the fact that African ambassadors to the United States, if they're in the American South, are not treated equally. He recounted in his biography that a new um, African ambassador was on his way to the United Nations. So he flew into Miami, um, and then before his connection went up to New York City, um, all of the white passengers on the plane were escorted off and taken to lunch in a restaurant. The African um, ambassador was escorted to the corner of the airplane hangar where they had a canvas stool set out for him and they had a sandwich that was wrapped in wax paper for him and then they got on their plane and they flew up to New York City. And then Dean Rusk had to ask that African ambassador to side with the United States on several key human rights votes. How's that gonna go? Again, you know, America's system of racial integration or segregation and lack of integration continues to be a sore spot, a point of embarrassment. President Kennedy, although he had signaled that he supported civil rights, he didn't really want to do a lot on civil rights early on. And he got a little annoyed when civil rights activists decided to act anyways. Uh, the Freedom Riders, which um, ultimately included uh, students from Nashville's sit-in movement, um, are trying to um, expose the fact that um, southern states are not following the Interstate Commerce Commission's uh, rules on integration of interstate commerce. Uh, so they are riding through the American South when in Anniston, Alabama, one of the buses is firebombed and burned. And then when they get to Birmingham, Alabama, a number of the um, pro activists, both black and white, are, including John Siegenthaler, um, are rather brutally beaten. What's Kennedy's response? He's really angry at the Freedom Riders. He says this is exactly the kind of thing the communists used to make the United States look bad around the world. Um, he's not at all sympathetic to the Freedom Riders, but is worried about how this is going to play on the international stage. Um, and indeed, the Moroccan newspaper Al Fair said that incidents like this uh, were clearly compromising the U.S. position of world leadership. Well, what's the Kennedy administration's solution? Well, they ensure that there will be no more mob violence toward the Freedom Riders. They're simply arrested at the Mississippi border and they're thrown in Parchman Prison. Um, he does a little bit better the next time around. When James Meredith um, is ordered by the courts to be admitted to the University of Mississippi in 1962, there are riots between federal law enforcement and um, angry whites that lead to the death of two people, including one who is a French journalist. But the next day, James Meredith enrolls and begins attending classes at the University of Mississippi. This earns the administration high marks internationally. Um, oops. A delegate from Upper Volta, which is a small country in Africa before the UN General Assembly, marveled that for one small Negro to go to school, the United States federal government threatens governors and judges with prison. It sends troops to occupy the University of Mississippi. So this was seen by the third world as a step in the right direction. This met the mark of the president doing what was seen as important. And Dean Rusk argued that shortly afterwards when the Cuban Missile Crisis comes to a head, the fact that the leaders of Algeria and Guinea would not allow Soviet planes to refuel in their countries showed that the United States was gaining some real traction in terms of human rights in the third world. And then Birmingham happens. 
So all of this sort of goodwill goes away pretty quickly as these photographs um, just accost people in the United States and throughout the world of police dogs and fire hoses being turned on nonviolent protesters. Um, 19 days later, um, Emperor Haile Selassie, who's the leader of Ethiopia, um, had a meeting of all of the heads of states of African countries. And they issue an open letter to the President of the United States. It was written um, by the Prime Minister of Uganda. And it read, the Negroes who have been subjected to the most inhuman treatment, who have been blasted with fire hoses, cranked up to such pressure that the water would strip bark off of trees, at whom the police have deliberately set snarling dogs, are our own kith and kin. The only offenses which these people have committed are that they are black, and they have demanded the right to be free and to hold their heads up as equal citizens of the United States. He goes on, so this is Milton Obate, the Prime Minister, said nothing is more paradoxical than that these events should take place in the United States. And at a time when that country is anxious to project its image before the world screen as the archetype of democracy and the champion of freedom. And in case this was a little too subtle and folks in the United States might miss his point, oops, he says, the eyes and ears of the world are concentrated on events in Alabama. And it is the duty of the free world and more so of the countries that hold themselves up as the leaders of that free world to see that all of their citizens, regardless of the color of their skin, are free. So this is a pretty strong statement from all of the assembled heads of state on the continent of Africa. What's the response by President Kennedy? On June 3rd, 1963, he addresses the nation um, and he says, we preach freedom around the world and we mean it. And we cherish our freedom here at home but are we to say to the world, and much more importantly to each other, that this is a land of the free, except for the Negroes? That we have no second class citizens except Negroes? That we have no class or caste system, no ghettos, no master class, except with respect to Negroes? This was his opening volley in proposing a Civil Rights Act to Congress that would eventually become the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, which eliminates uh, dis racial discrimination in public facilities. Um, of course, Kennedy would not live to see that. The March on Washington also uh, serves to promote that. And I'm going to wind up my story there so that we're going to have a little time. Uh, but a couple of conclusions. Um, international pressure does play a part. So notice it's bold, underlined, and italics, right? Without a vital activist community here, you know, it wouldn't have happened. But it's important, I think, to realize that the international community did play a part, especially in the way that U.S. presidents choose to play a role or not play a role in the civil rights movement. Um, and that becomes especially true as modern media and democracy, right, mean that what happens in the United States does not stay in the United States. Um, it is beamed all over the world. And that those images influence what the United States can do around the world. So our domestic policies and foreign policies are intertwined. And ultimately, I hope you understand that human rights are important. They're for everyone. They will always be contested they will, and will always have to fight to establish and preserve them. That Universal Declaration of Human Rights, still have a long way to go to recognize those rights that uh, the world said in 1948 everyone should have. Bibliography, it's always important, right? Uh, Carol Anderson's book, Eyes Off the Prize, especially focuses on that story of the NAACP and the National Negro Congress and their efforts to work through the United Nations in that period before the Civil Rights Movement. I put that in air quotes because the Civil Rights Movement doesn't start with Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, Carol's a friend of mine. We went through graduate school together. Uh, Mary Dudziak's Cold War Civil Rights um, especially focuses on those images and the way that they're received around the world.
um, especially looking at the impact uh, for the Kennedy administration. Michael Krenn's article in Diplomatic H History focused on that 1958 World's Fair exhibit and the responses to it. And my book looks in part at the UN, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So if there are things that you want to learn more about, there we go. And with that, I'm going to stop and say that I have squished a lot of stuff in, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about any of these several presidential administrations and a couple decades of international uh, diplomacy that you might want to know more about. Yes? How much longer do you think it would have taken for the Civil Rights Act to have passed without the international pressure? Ah, well, so that's an interesting domestic political question. I don't think it would have passed if Kennedy had lived. Um, I think it took Lyndon Johnson um, and his political acumen and his ability to sort of mobilize the emotions of the American people by uh, posing the Civil Rights Act as what John F. Kennedy would have wanted to get it uh, through Congress. Um, but he certainly um, wanted to be seen as a leader of civil rights and to increase his international profile. Um, he will gladly accept all the plaudits that come his way for the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And then you would think, okay, you know, legal civil rights are here, so international world, international community is going to love us? Nope. Vietnam War um, is going to sort of sidetrack any sort of efforts to promote ourselves again um, as champions of human rights. So we keep working on that. Uh, there's another book that looks at the 1970s and particularly the Carter administration's efforts to um, elevate human rights as part of American foreign policy. It's an effort to sort of rejuvenate that agenda after the Vietnam War. Thanks for that question. Yes? As one who grew up in that era, and it's like a walk down memory lane, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I was born in 1942. I recognized all figures in your in your presentation. Uh, I can say in those years, I lived in Nashville during the sit-ins, you know, in the lunch counter sit-ins. I can say in all those years, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, when you were talking about the surveys that they gave out to the 10 cities, what were some of the questions that they asked? Um, so first of all, they asked sort of, you know, how do you think race relations in the United States are? Uh, <laughs> um, and how are African Americans treated? And then I didn't see all of the survey sort of items uh, that led to those conclusions from the State Department. I pulled that mostly from Mary Dudziak. Um, I graduated high school at Central. Um, have you seen any um, initial response to the certification? Um, in Little Rock? Of the, the whole country, how they look at that. Well, so, so I'm going to step away from my foreign policy I, and put on my Tennessee historian hat. One of the things that stuns me is that Clinton High School in Tennessee is desegregated first, but it doesn't draw s nearly the same attention, even though um, there's violence uh, around that. But Little Rock becomes the focus uh, for whatever reason. Um, and certainly, <laughs> Um, in part, I think it's because of the governor's response, uh, where Governor Clement um, was much more uh, trying to ensure peaceful integration. Um, Arkansas's governor had a different um, sort of agenda. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that really raised the international profile and led Eisenhower to decide that U.S. troops had to be sent in. So that's a significant change in comparison. So Tennessee does a lot better than Arkansas does in terms of that early integration. Um, but it's going to take a long time for integration of public schools to really take hold in the American South after those first couple of cases. But I don't think I answered your question. I mean, like, was it an overwhelmingly positive reaction from other states? Or? Um, it depended on what side of the Mason-Dixon line yeah. you generally were on. Um, certainly, there is racial discrimination and informal segregation in the North. When we look at Brown versus Board of Education, of course, Linda Brown, you know, is not from a deep South, <laughs> a deep South state. 
um, that, and we see violence in Boston um, as you move to sort of redraw uh, school lines um, and use busing to actually integrate the populations in schools. Um, so it kind of depended on whether it was folks who identified the South as they're different than us, they're worse than us, or whether they really recognized we're really kind of in the same boat. We just don't like to acknowledge it in the same way. Um, but you see some odd, well, not odd, uh, but you see lots of different groups coming together. Um, so the National Council of Churches had put together an organization. Um, they recognized that racial integration was a key issue dividing the country. And they send a Southern Baptist minister named Will Campbell, uh, who's a white Baptist minister, uh, he goes out to Little Rock and helps escort the students. He's the only white person who's asked to join the Southern Christian Leadership Conference when it's formed. Um, you have lots of Catholic nuns who sort of show up and join civil rights. So you get interesting and sort of odd cross sections of Americans who feel um, that the system of racial segregation offends their values as Americans, as Christians, in ways you might not always expect Yes. Um, so I'm curious, from your perspective and given the history you just laid out for us, uh, how do you feel the international community has evolved in terms of being able to call out the United States for its hypocrisy, particularly maybe given the current administration that we have? Well, interestingly, um, I, I'm going to go back to a historical question okay. more. Um, when I look at the non-aligned movement, folks like Nasser, Nehru, they very much have the moral high ground um, in the 40s, 50s, and even into the 1960s. You know, they've won sort of battles, um, either nonviolent or violent battles, to gain their country's independence. Um, but as we move into the 70s and 80s, and a lot of those um, leaders aren't really interested in democratic change. They think they should continue in power sort of indefinitely. They sort of lose their moral high ground ultimately. Um, so their hypocrisy in some ways talking about democracy and human rights and their records erode their ability to be critical of other countries such as the United States and Western Europe. Um, probably the most Best um, recent example, so Robert Mugabe um, of Zimbabwe, right? So he was one of the leaders fighting for Zimbabwean uh, independence, finally gained in 74. But then, you know, he increasingly, you know, clung on to power, was willing to do whatever was required for him to remain in power. And so it, it really sort of, and if you look at South Africa, uh, the African National Congress is now under this sort of huge cloud of corruption and other um, sort of allegations where, you know, initially they're seen as, right, the good guys. It's hard to govern. <laughs> it's especially hard. Uh, there aren't a lot of good examples of um, leaders of liberation struggles who become effective leaders. Uh, Lech Walesa is one of my, you know, favorite examples. He was the person to lead Poland out of communist rule, and he was not the person to lead a free Poland afterwards. Um, so it's almost a different skill set, I think, sometimes that is required. Uh, but I think it's uh, the changing position and in internal dynamics in a lot of those third world countries that erodes their ability to serve as credible or authentic critics. Uh, so the international community, I think, has actually become a lot more jaded <laughs> um, over time. Um, I think fewer countries are willing to sort of put themselves forward in those idealistic terms. Um, but that's my view for today. But don't give up on those ideals. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think you know where you're going or what you stand for. Um, going back to the questions for about like Clinton, did they use the Clinton quote in any way? The United States is any like kind of positive? Like, I mean, I, I know there was violence and stuff still, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, it would be that'd be a great article to look at, um, I, but I haven't looked at that specifically. Um, I. I just remember I was uh, doing a teaching workshop 
um, as part of Teaching American History um, initiative. And I learned about it. I'm like, why didn't I ever hear this story? You know, it, it wasn't part of, you know, the sort of eyes on the prize, you know, the big PBS series. It wasn't part of that narrative. It wasn't part of the narrative on civil rights that I learned about when I was growing up. So I was really surprised to learn about it. And um, yeah, that's a good next step to sort of look at, you know, is there any effort? Um, generally, the United States um, sought to sort of counteract um, these sort of negative views by sending sort of famous African Americans on speaking tours overseas, um, especially uh, jazz artists. Uh, Louis Armstrong served on a number of sort of goodwill tours. Uh, a woman named Edith Sampson uh, goes on a speaking tour of Scandinavia, basically arguing that African Americans are doing just fine in the American South through the 50s. Um, a little disingenuous, but the State Department's response is to send out um, uh, African Americans to, you know, sort of present the view they want presented, and they start pulling passports. So W. E. B. Du Bois loses his passport, his ability to travel outside of the country. A number, uh, Paul Robeson, uh, who was a famous performer and then activist, loses his ability to travel. Um, so that's something federal governments <laughs> start doing. They get to determine who travels overseas and who doesn't. Um, so they would grant access to folks presenting the views that they wanted and prevent as much as they could um, others from presenting their views. Interestingly, um, so it's not until the Kennedy administration that W.B. Du Bois gets his um, passport back and he chooses then to go to Ghana, uh, one of the newly independent countries in Africa, and he spends his last years there. He leaves the United States altogether. I think you all know what time it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give you the last question. I okay. know you're a historian and not a prognosticator, mm -hmm. um, but what do we need to be doing to regain any moral high ground based on our American values? Well, it would help if there was some agreement on what American values were. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.